Good evening, everybody, and welcome. We are so glad to have you here for this very important topic, multiple sclerosis and urological issues. I'm Alexa Jett, and I'm with ANCAN, and this is a super interactive webinar. We want you to ask your questions. You should see on the right-hand side of your screen a questions pane, and please feel free to write your questions at any time during, and we'll get to them in the Q&A. I'd like to draw your attention real quick to our disclaimer. This is not medical advice, but we sure hope you learned something from it tonight. And we also want to give a big thank you to our sponsors, Myovant Sciences Pfizer, Foundation Medicine, a couple takes on MS, Jennifer and Dan Digman, and MS for MS. And I would like to call now our founder, Rick Davis. Evening, everybody. It's a, it's a real pleasure and a, 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 and a privilege to present this to you today and uh, this webinar today. Um, we have to give full credit to the Digmans because they saw the opportunity to make this presentation and they, they pulled in MS for MS. Uh, we recognize this is a topic that does not get talked about too much. Um, I hear it mentioned frequently in our uh, virtual MS chat support groups, um, gets talked about a lot, um, but I think by and large, uh, nowhere near enough. And so we are thrilled to welcome Dr. Rachel Rubin tonight. And uh, I'm going to ask Sam Britt Greenberg momentarily to introduce Dr. Rubin. And I feel that at the end of this evening, um, we'll all be a lot better educated and um, maybe even we'll be able to follow up with, with a second webinar in this series. So thank you all for attending and um, I will pass this over to Sam. Thanks so much, Rick, and thank you for having me. Thank you for the Digmans for the introduction. Uh, it's an honor to be here. As Rick had mentioned, my name is Sam Greenberg. I'm the founder of MS4MS. Uh, for those who haven't heard of us, uh, we stand, uh, the full name is Mission Stadiums for Multiple Sclerosis. Um, we're a 501c3 sports and entertainment focused nonprofit organization that raises funds for MS research while spreading awareness uh, in sports stadiums across the country. Uh, for those who, who don't know our background story, I actually started MS4MS about 10 years ago in honor of my grandmother who suffered from MS. She suffered over 30 years. And as a college baseball player, I always wanted to use sports as a platform to raise awareness and raise funds to ultimately help find a cure. Um, in the journey that, that has been MS for MS, we host in-person and virtual events across the country. And we use our slogan, Spreading Orange, um, to promote our four pillars, which is awareness, support, hope, and action. Uh, and if anybody's interested in getting involved in our movement and supporting the cause in a fun, unique way using sports and entertainment as a platform, you can actually visit ms4ms.org, uh, reach out and be more than happy to share more information. Uh, additionally, I'm excited to, to share that over the last three years, the organization has raised over $300,000 to help support the fight against MS. Um, proceeds from the organization goes directly to the Johns Hopkins MS Research Center, which is one of the top leading research centers in the entire country. And we also donate funds directly to families affected by MS. Um, everyone who has MS or it's MS has touched their family, it affects them in different ways. And sometimes financial support can go a long way, along with the support and the awareness that we provide for all families that, that get connected with MS for MS. Um, through Hopkins, um, it's an honor to to now actually introduce the main guest speaker for this evening. Our relationships and the MS community um, is continuing to grow. And it's an honor for me to have met Dr. Rachel Rubin, who will be the main speaker this evening. And, and I'd like to pass the torch over to her uh, in order to, uh, to take the rest of the webinar away and share the incredible information that she's about to. So thank you once again for having me. Um, if anybody has any questions or follow-up, feel free to reach out through our ms4ms.org website, 
And once again, thank you, Dr. Rubin, for joining us this evening. And uh, the floor is yours. In, in good screen mode, is it yes. correct? Okay. Looking, looking good. All right, perfect. And yeah. I can't see any of your, okay. All right, I, am, I can't see my own face, but that's okay. I don't need to see what I look like. Um, it's such an, oh, there I am. Um, it is such an honor to be here. I am, um, gosh, I'm so grateful. I'm Dr. Rachel Rubin. Um, I am a urologist um, in Washington, D.C., and I did a fellowship in something called sexual medicine. So I take care of all genders uh, for all sorts of urinary problems and sexual health conditions. And um, I love talking about uncomfortable topics. I love talking about things that make people squirm. I love talking about things that um, affect people's quality of life. And I like taking a lot of time with people. My passion is um, what I would say is a, a, a value-based medicine and, and spending as much time as possible to getting to know people and to build them the multidisciplinary team that they need to thrive and to really you know, maximize their goals. Um, so um, today, um, and please use the chat box, go to the question and answer sessions. Um, I am uh, just thrilled to be here and happy to answer questions. Uh, once you hear me start, start speaking, you will realize that I can go on and on and on. Uh, if you like what you hear, I'm very chatty on social media. I would say Twitter is my best. Uh, Facebook is I'm trying to get better at and Instagram is something I'm learning, but at all three places, you can find me at Dr. Rachel Rubin. And I would love uh, to have you along in the discussion. And in any way I can reach out to support groups or help more people, um, please, please uh, uh, let us know. Um, let's see here. Let's get my slides going, I think. Here we go. Um, so today we're going to talk about um, sort of um, the multiple sclerosis and lower urinary tract dysfunction. We're going to talk urology, but I'm going to try to tie in sort of all of the things that I do and really just give you an overview of all of the things that can happen and that maybe aren't so easy to talk with your doctor uh, about. Um, I, I want to give a big plug here that quality of life, it really matters. And I know I'm preaching to the choir as you are human beings uh, who care very much about your quality of life, but I really want you to understand that no one thing defines you. No one disease state defines you. Uh, and it's really important to always think of yourself in what, what I like to call a biopsychosocial approach. So your biology matters. Uh, where you come from matters. Where you want to go matters. Your relationships matter. Your, the way you live in this world matters. Um, and in order to kind of give you that maximal quality of life, um, we're big believers in the multidisciplinary approach and that um, it's really hard in one doctor's visit that's maybe 10 or 15 minutes long to get everything you need out of it. And so sometimes you may have three urologists. Maybe you have one urologist who focuses on your neurogenic bladder. Maybe you have one urologist who focuses on your sexual health. Maybe you have a specific MS doctor. Maybe you have a pelvic floor physical therapist or a mental health professional. And all of that is important and is valuable. And so it's really important to understand that we have to build you a team that really does address your quality of life, but that you may not get it from one single provider. Um, in fact, sexual health and, and urinary health is important for everybody, no matter how um, far, like even the most um, sickest of patients, when you ask them, um, you know, is, is intimacy important to you? Um, even people on their deathbed will say, you know, it's it's really hard to find someone uh, 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 in a new relationship when you are sick. Um, I would like a partner. Um, I uh, lost a lot of weight and I have a lot of body image issues or I have weakness. I have fatigue. I have a fear and embarrassment. I'm afraid, you know, of, of um, wetting myself or having incontinence. Um, I'm afraid of how I look now and, and I'm not as comfortable in my own skin. And so it, it's really important that you understand that that quality of life and intimacy and love and connection and vulnerability, all of that never doesn't become important, right? No matter how um, sick you are, it is always important and it is always worthy of a discussion and worthy of uh, something to, to, to bring up with your medical team. Now, if you're not getting the care that you need, you need to add to your medical team and realize that not every provider can give you everything. And I'm a big believer in explaining things through biology, in really medicalizing people in a way that you can use your 
biology, whether you have MS or prostate cancer or um, um, a history of trauma, whatever you have going on in your life, how do we use that biology to really understand what's going on in your body and then explain how do we then maximize uh, treatments to make sure things can work you know, as best as possible. And a lot of that is through really understanding anatomy, right? When you understand how your body works, when you understand what MS is doing to your body, it becomes less scary. And it also becomes a target for us understanding how to better treat it, right? If we didn't under if we understand it, then we can understand how better to find solutions and treatments out there. And I spend a lot of my time really thinking about this picture, actually. I can boil down my day-to-day -day patient interactions really with this picture, because what happens is someone comes to see me, and everyone is different. And that's why I love my job, because I get to be a detective that really sits with people and really tries to understand the one person in, or the couple in front of me. And I have to break everything, all the stories down into my head. And this is how I do it. I say, okay, what's going on in this person's brain? right? What's going on in their spinal cord and what is going on at the genitals or the bladder or the urethra themselves. And MS can affect all of these areas, right? And so it becomes, you know, everyone even with MS will have something different going on with them. And it really becomes detective work of figuring out what are the urinary and sexual pathologies or issues that the person is, is, is describing and how can we, again, maximize treatment. So when you can break it down um, to yourself of where is the actual issue, then you can better understand what we do about the issue. And nerves, listen, I'm not going to teach you anything you don't all already know, but of course the nerves are coming from the spinal cord. And when they come out of the spinal cord, they come in a large web and they innervate the, the, the bowels, the bladder, the prostate, the penis, or if you don't have a prostate or a penis, the uterus, the vagina, the vulva, the clitoris, right? So all of these nerves just come together in a mesh framework. So of course, anything that's going to affect your, affect your bladder, and we're going to spend a lot of time tonight talking about bladder issues, anything that affects your bladder will also potentially affect all of your sexual organs as well, which can certainly affect quality of life and sexual health. And so again, when one system is not running as smoothly, oftentimes the other system is also not running as smoothly. And this is the female anatomy, which is incredibly hormonally sensitive. Hormones play a big role. And so as hormones decline, uh, especially for women, uh, and certainly for men too, but much more drastically in women, the vulva, the vagina, the bladder, the urethra, actually have physical changes that happen to them when it is deplete, depleted of hormones. And so women over 50 will often have dryness, a pain with sexual activity, irritation, burning and itching, but actually it's not just about sex, it's, it's about urinary frequency, urgency and recurrent urinary tract infections. So if you take someone with MS who already has urinary frequency, urgency and recurrent urinary tract infections, and then you age them over 50, they're going to have all of the menopausal reasons to have it as well as all of the MS reasons to have it and you have a, a sort of a horrible situation. And so it's really important to treat the hormonal aspects with local hormones uh, to keep this tissue as thick, as healthy, and as functioning as possible to prevent urinary tract infections. We'll talk about that. It's one of my biggest passion projects in the world um, is treating what we call genitourinary syndrome of menopause or GSM, which happens to almost all women over 50 when their ovaries stop producing hormones. Um, but then again, you add the neurological issues of MS and it's just going to compound on itself. And of course, we know uh, uh, patients with MS have a, a significant incidence of bladder dysfunction or bladder issues, really, really uh, common problems that we see. Um, we know that these uh, lesions can block or delay the normal neurologic signals that control the bladder and the urinary sphincter. Um, and so the symptoms that we see or that you experience, right, are, and, and I don't have to tell you what you experience, many of you will have to leave this call to go to the bathroom because you have frequency or urgency, uh, difficulty starting your stream, uh, a lot of nighttime urination, or even the loss of urine, or the inability to empty the bladder completely. So it's sort of like Goldilocks, sometimes it, where it's over, it's in overdrive, or it's not working well enough. And again, everyone is going to have something a little bit different, which is why I can't lecture and tell you everybody what everybody has. Every single person is their, a unique individual. 
So again, when you look at how a bladder is supposed to work, right, the bladder is supposed to be filling, and then at some point you're going to feel the need to go to the bathroom, and then the, the, the muscles don't contract. We don't increase our bladder pressures typically until we're ready to void, and then we empty the bladder, and then the bladder calms down again. Well, this is a very sort of elegant process, and again, understanding that there are three like neurological processes that are happening uh, very much in the fight or flight realm of getting your bladder to work properly. So uh, when we are um, relaxing our bladder, it's actually in the contracted or sympathetic tone, sort of uh, when it, it doesn't need to go when you are relaxed, it's the parasympathetic and your bladder, it, when you're ready to empty your bladder, that parasympathetic action is going to squeeze your bladder to empty it. It's going to relax that urinary sphincter, um, which is also being controlled by the somatic pudendal nerves, which again, it's just to say that all of these neurological neurological pathways can be affected, of course, through MS, and everyone could have a different area that may be affected depending on the lesions that they have. And so all of these nerves, the hypogastric nerves, the pelvic nerves, and the pudendal nerves are also all of the same nerves that affect erectile function, a clitoral function, orgasm, arousal, um, and, and um, lubrication uh, and ejaculation. And so if you have issues with bladder function, as I said, it is not a, a, a hard to believe that you may have issues with sexual function as well. And so many of the medications that are out there sort of act on the receptor levels of some of these uh, processes. So we've got the uh, beta receptors where, you know, if you can activate them, your bladder does not uh, uh, calm, it doesn't squeeze as much. You can do the anticholinergic, um, which have side effects as well um, that can certainly affect muscle contraction as well. And certainly understanding how all the bladder is just a muscle and nerves act on muscle. And so how that all uh, plays, you need healthy nerves to have a healthy bladder. So uh, again, uh, we, we mentioned this, but your bladder may be overactive where you've got too much frequency, urgency, or even some incontinence. You may have a bladder that just doesn't stretch, right? The muscles are not, uh, they're really, um, uh, they're not malleable. They're not stretching the way that it's supposed to. So you may have a, 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 a incorrect pressures, which can actually cause some kidney damage. Um, you may have incontinence, where if you cough, laugh, or sneeze, um, you lose a lot of urine. And now that may be due to MS issues. It could be due to childbirth. It could be due to uh, uh, um, increased weight. There are all sorts of things, or prolapse of, of, of the tissue. All sorts of things can cause incontinence. And again, you can have multiple things which can compound on each other. Um, again, um, we talked about this, but uh, hold on, we can keep going. Um, really, the goals of treatment are quality of, first of all, make sure your kidneys are healthy. That's important. Uh, prevent infections, prevent skin from breaking down. Um, but really, it's to improve your quality of life. I will always, my goal in ever treating someone is really understanding the person in front of me. And what do you want? What is going to make your life better? And how can we, knowing what's going on, how can we work together to improve your quality of life? For both you and any of your partners or caregivers, um, it's really a team discussion, and, and that's really important. And never be shy about advocating for your right to have a quality of life. Never. Uh, you have to sometimes yell and scream for it, but you deserve it. So what are the barriers? I mean, these are genitals. Gosh, this lady's talking about bladders and clitorises and vaginas and penises. I am so embarrassed even hearing her say these words. I'm sitting here on this uh, webinar blushing. Um, most people don't bring these things up with their doctors. They feel embarrassed. Doctors don't often ask about it because they don't find it important. They're not living a, a, a leaky life. They're not a, a bothered by the urgency or frequency or realizing that just to get to their office, you had to stop six times to go to the bathroom. And so doctors often don't bring it up or don't refer um, or, or, you know, really don't some doctors don't even know that there are treatments available. Maybe they're not specialists or they don't even know who to send you to. And so sometimes you do have to do the research yourself as a patient or work with amazing um, groups uh, like the ones hosting this webinar tonight that can help get you to people who will listen or who will help get you to the right group uh, to help you. So when you go see a urologist and even in urology, right, there are 
general urologists who know a little bit about these things, but then there are super specialists. I wouldn't even categorize myself as a super specialist for what we call neurogenic bladders. I'm a sexual medicine super specialist. Um, but when it comes to, I, I have a best friend uh, who works at Georgetown who is the super specialist who I send all of my patients to get urodynamics. Excuse me, I, I have a little bit of a cold, hopefully nothing serious. Um, so when you go see a urologist, and I always recommend people see someone who has an interest and a, a, even a fellowship in neurogenic bladders, if the bladder issues are the things that are bothering you the most, you uh, want to do, uh, you're, you're going to go to the doctor, they're just going to talk to you, they may examine you, um, it's good to get an exam so they can see if there's any, you know, if you have a vulva, if there are any hormonal changes that have happened because of menopause, um, certainly uh, uh, rectal exams can be helpful um, if you're a male, you know, with a prostate. Um, they may do a urinalysis, a culture, and they may do a little ultrasound on your belly to see if you're emptying your bladder well. It's not scary. It's not invasive. It does not hurt. Uh, they may order an ultrasound of your kidneys to make sure your kidneys are healthy uh, as well, which if, there's too, if your bladder pressures are too high, it can back up and affect your kidney function. And they may do this really strange and funky test. And if you've ever had this done, you're probably rolling your eyes and saying, oh my God, Ruben, that was the worst thing ever. Um, hopefully this technology, I've heard rumors that this technology is only going to get better, which uh, there's no place for it to go but up. Um, Eurodynamics is a, a, an important test that can really help understand the different pressures and the sensations and things that are going on in your bladder. It's sort of like a stress test for your bladder, just like if you get a cardiac stress test, you run on the treadmill. This is, uh, they put up a couple of catheters and um, a pressure monitors, and they fill up your bladder to kind of see your bladder fill. Um, and ask you if you have to pee, and they can see the bladder squeezing extra and really understand sort of what's going on with your bladder. So you can think of it as a stress test for your bladder and really trying to understand what's happening. Now, that's kind of the workup when you go to the doctor, but what are the treatments? Well, listen, everything, like anything, we've got lots of conservative uh, therapies, but then we can certainly talk about medications and surgeries and things like that. And it depends on what is going on with you. So what are conservative uh, uh, treatments? Well, if we think nerve and we think muscle, again, think um, no differently than if this is, I was just saying before we got on this call, Everyone who's ever heard the word sciatica before understands that it's not a leg problem, even though the person has leg pain, but it's actually a back problem. And so similarly, a lot of these bladder issues are nerve and musculoskeletal issues. And so while we can't uh, cure the MS, and of course there are treatments for MS, and I'm, I, will, I will be the first to tell you that I'm no expert in, in MS, and you all know much more than I do, but Oftentimes, there's a musculoskeletal component that the nerves are affecting. And so working with um, a very skilled physical therapists who work on the pelvic organ. So there are what's called pelvic floor physical therapists. They are geniuses. They are the most wonderful humans in the world. Uh, and they can really help you train your bladder uh, to work better for you, to work better in your life. And that may be a learning how to time a uh, void and, and tell your bladder, okay, I know you feel like you have to pee every 15 minutes, but I'm going to set my timer and we're going to go 20 minutes and I'm not going to go and over time, just like a muscle, you can work your bicep over time, you can train that bladder muscle to work better. Um, also, uh, there's a lot of, of, of different biofeedback training and a lot of different things that they can do on the musculoskeletal uh, front to help you. There are many foods and beverages and things that are called bladder irritants. If you Google bladder irritants, you'll find a whole list of very delicious uh, looking food. I'm drinking some hot tea right now, which is a bladder irritant. If I give my four-year-old a juice box, he is going to pee 20 times more than if I just give him some water. So I have learned that sugar is a bladder irritant. And true, I hate telling my patients that they have to... Uh, change their diets, but but I do, there are some patients whose bladders are very sensitive to certain uh, foods and drinks. And so we kind of work together to figure out what those are. I, I, I'm a big believer in, I don't want to believe that this is true, although uh, it turns out it probably is a little bit true. 
for incontinence. Um, there are a lot of products just at your regular CVS that you can get. There are certain incontinence pads and um, and depends. Uh, we barrier creams that people can use to avoid skin breakdown. And there are some incredible uh, new advances in underwear, uh, whether it's for uh, menstrual cycles or for leakage, where you don't necessarily uh, you, you invest a little bit more upfront. But these are things you could throw in the washing machine. And I think this was created by a female urologist, which I love. I love women who go into urology. Uh, and so uh, there are some underwear options. Um, certainly there are, uh, actually this is a, a newer one called a pure wick, which at nighttime you can put it in and then it basically will collect the, the urine um, uh, right on the, the, the tissue and will get it away from uh, the, the vulva and the vagina so the skin doesn't break down. And this is a really lovely product that it's becoming more and more commonly used. Uh, for men, there are external catheters or condom catheters, which can be very helpful as well. Um, there are different things like clamps and, and all sorts of things to help with incontinence. There are medications. There are anticholinergic medications and beta agonist medications. Uh, these are medications that do help um, basically relax the bladder. And so they make it so that you don't have as much need to go, go, go. And so some of the uh, side effects for the anticholinergics can be dry mouth and constipation, even confusion. So uh, we tend to try to not use those as much as possible. Uh, the beta agonists seem to be a little better tolerated, but also a lot more expensive and insurance companies don't often want to cover them. And so it's oftentimes people have tried all of them. They've tried certain ones together. They've uh, doubled up. Um, and so um, it's really, unfortunately, it's not a one size fits all. I wish it were, but you really have to sort of uh, try different things and trial and error and uh, figure out what is working for you. But I love making sure there's a physical therapist on board. Uh, obviously this multimodal treatment, it seems to work the best. Another then is what we call third line therapies, which can be first line if that's what you choose. Uh, sometimes, uh, listen, I think a botulinum toxin can be mir miraculous. So uh, putting Botox in someone's bladder can make it not squeeze so much. And so it really does work wonders for people to get that bladder to relax. Um, you can uh, uh, put a little, we'll, we'll talk about each one of these. So the bladder Botox is a procedure. Some uh, can, You can have it done in the office. Uh, you don't even have to go undergo anesthesia for it. They put a tiny camera inside your bladder and, and put tiny little bits of, of bot botulinum toxin throughout your bladder and so that your bladder relaxes more. And it can last up to three to six months, even as much as 12 months. Um, and it can be extremely life preserving for many, many people. Uh, there is a small risk of a urinary tract infection. And if you relax the bladder too much, it may require, uh, you may have a difficult time urinating and you may have to catheterize. Um, the, there's another, I, I promise I don't usually sound this congested, my goodness. There's another treatment called peripheral tibial nerve stimulation or PTNS. It's sort of like acupuncture. Uh, remember, I said sciatica, those are nerves to your legs or the same nerves to your bladder and your genitals. So if you take an acupuncture needle and you hook it up to your ankle and you hook it up to an electrode, it turns out it helps with urinary frequency and urgency and it might help a little with sexual function as well, which is wild. Why? Because it's the same nerve pattern. Pathways. And so this is a, a treatment you go into your doctor's office weekly for 12 weeks and it's FDA approved to help with urinary urgency. While it is not really, we need more data in MS patients, it's certainly low risk. Very, uh, there, there really are no bad things that can happen. Um, it's just whether you respond to it or not. There are uh, something called a sacroneuromodulator, which uh, has really, uh, the technology has improved drastically. Uh, I used to hate this solution for my MS patients because um, it, it was not MRI compatible. I said, what are you gonna do? Put a device in somebody who needs MRIs frequently. You know, and so it was, it was really, you were always stuck between a rock and a hard place because it can be very helpful uh, for, um, a neurogenic bladder. And so now they are becoming MRI compatible, which is so huge and really, really uh, excellent. So you put almost like a pacemaker uh, around the nerves and the spine that are overactive or causing you know, too much activity uh, happening. So I think there's more data and more excitement to come from the neuromodulation space. Now that's when your bladder's overactive and it's uh, a sort of a, a too uh, a working too hard. Uh, of course, there can be incontinence where um, 
where uh, you leak, where you leak urine. And it can be your male who leaks urine or a female who leaks urine. Of course, uh, you can work on diet and exercise and all those types of things. There are clamps, there are pessaries that, that can be used. Pelvic floor exercises are very helpful here. Um, when it comes to surgical options, there's a bulking agent where there's a new one actually on the market that's very exciting. It lasts for seven years. Uh, my own mother uh, during pandemic had this done and it's totally dry, which is just wild because she was uh, leaking quite a bit. Um, so you can get a, a bulking agent put in so that um, you don't leak urine. Uh, this is in females. They, I believe they're studying it right now in males. Um, there are sling procedures. Uh, for both males and females and then on the male side and the female side rarely uh, but on the male side uh, for very bad incontinence they can put in an artificial urinary sphincter which is almost like a balloon that keeps the urethra closed um, uh, of course I think it's really important to understand that people with MS also get other pathologies. So just like menopause happens to everyone who has MS over 50 uh, and who is a woman, um, men who get MS will get enlarged prostates. They may have urethral strictures. Uh, women may get uh, pelvic organ prolapse. Like other medical problems happen, even though you know MS is, is seems to be the predominant diagnosis. And so it's really important to understand that not everything may be a factor of MS, but there may be other medical problems going on as you age. And so getting someone to really, really understand what's happening. And so catheterization is something that often gets talked about uh, uh, with uh, people who have just horrible um, uh, symptoms, whether it's intermittent catheterization, learning how to catheterize yourself. Uh, some people will will um, will try to get a, a super pubic tube or a little a tube that goes in your uh, right uh, kind of above your pubic bone, um, and that uh, can empty urine. Um, some people will just uh, put, take a catheter, you know, from the the um, directly from the urethra either the penis or in the vulva and attach it to a leg bag. And, and that works for some people. It needs to be changed about every month or so. And so, um, excuse me. So urinary tract infections is um, something I care very much about because these can kill you. Uh, urinary tract infections are really dangerous. Um, and, and anyone who's had a urinary tract infections knows how horrible they feel. But really, it's, it, it can go up to your kidneys, it can cause fevers and chills, you can get acute change in uh, your mental status, um, it can flare your MS. I've seen this a lot, actually, where we get consulted in the hospital for someone with a horrible MS flare that has a horrible urinary tract infection. And it's really important that not all bacteria in the bladder needs to be treated with antibiotics, but that if you do have a urinary tract infection, we have to do everything that we can to prevent urinary tract infections. And there's a number of different ways that we do this. But any female over the age of 50 who is getting urinary tract infections absolutely, absolutely should be on local vaginal estrogen therapy, not necessarily hormones for your whole body, but local, local vaginal estrogen therapy that can prevent urinary tract infections. So if the tissue doesn't have hormones, it becomes thin and raw and irritated. And so adding back the hormones thickens up the tissue, allows it to lubricate, and it keeps it acidic so it can fight infection. So um, acidity of the vagina is so important because it can fight infection and fix the frequency, the urgency, and make it so you don't get recurrent urinary tract infection. And so the American Urologic Association came out in 2019 and said anyone who is peri or postmenopausal who does have recurrent urinary tract infections should really be given vaginal estrogen therapy to reduce the risk of future UTIs if there is no contraindication to estrogen therapy. I will put women with breast cancer on vaginal estrogen therapy, let alone people who are afraid of breast cancer. Breast ca estrogen does not cause breast cancer. There is no uh, in increased risk of blood clots, strokes, heart attacks, dementia. Vaginal estrogen is one of the most safest. I actually think it's the only essential oil that, that exists in this world. Uh, it is so safe to do, but it only works if you keep using it. And so there are a number of different ways to treat this genitourinary syndrome of menopause. Some people use creams, some people use vaginal vaginal inserts. Some people put a ring in their vagina that stays in for three months. All of these are good options, but you have to do them as, as uh, prescribed. So uh, if it's a cream, you have to use it every day for two weeks and then twice a week 
till death do part forever and ever. And if you don't keep using it, you won't keep getting the benefits and you will get urinary tract infections. And so someone who has MS, who's already has not emptying so well or leaking, um, you are very, very prone to urinary tract infections. So we must uh, acidify the vagina and keep it uh, healthy so that the bladder and the urethra can get those benefits to prevent urinary tract infections. There are some other tips and tricks, good hydration. There's a little bit of data about cranberry supplements uh, 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 and D-mannose as well as uh, methenamine, um, which can help as well. So it's really, really important that we, we, we arm you with all of the tools to prevent infections. And so, um, I have unlimited things to talk to you all about, uh, whether it's for sexual function or urinary function, but I do want to make sure we have time for an interactive a, a part of questions and, and really um, I, I want to make sure um, that you feel heard and uh, happy to see what you have to say in the chat box or in the question and answer session. I'm just honored to be here and uh, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much, Dr. Rubens. I loved your presentation. I am so glad this is being recorded because with my MS brain right now, I can't keep track of it. So all the other audience members, don't worry about all the information. It will be recorded and be on the ANCAN YouTube website later this week, probably. So do not worry about that. But we do have some questions that have come up. One of the questions is, have you ever heard of using essential oils to help overactive bladder? So as I said in my presentation, I think the only essential oil out there is vaginal estrogen. And so if, um, you know, I always say that vaginal estrogen is the baseline foundation that which any other treatment can be added onto. So I'll tell you this, if I see a 60 year old woman who comes in and says, I've got MS, Dr. Rubin, I'm getting urinary tract infections, I'm peeing all over the place, sex is painful, I actually forget it, I can't even have any intimacy with my partner because everything hurts down there. The first thing I am going to do with this patient, the very first thing I'm going to do is put her on vaginal estrogen therapy and say, come back in two months and we're gonna add from there. Maybe we have to do a beta agonist or an anticholinergic or PTNS or get more urinary uh, uh, testing, but it is the baseline and nothing else will fully uh, work itself out unless the tissue is healthy. Does that make sense? And so my answer to, to essential oils is, there's no data. We have no data on any essential oil that actually will, if it helps you and you notice benefit, if you know, then talk to your doctor and, and it's likely okay. But you want to make sure that you're maximizing the, the things that are out there that have been well studied. And if it works really well, then we all have to know about it because then we can put it to the test and actually do some, uh, some research on it. But it's true that if you're relaxed, Right? If your muscles are relaxed, things are going to work better. So different things relax different people. Uh, so if you find that that lavender smell really relaxes you, then you, you go on and, and, and keep doing that. Is there any treatment for genital numbness? Oh, that's such a good question and really important. Um, so genital numbness is very, very common in um, anybody who has any kind of spine pathology, right? The nerves to the clitoris, the nerves to the penis, the nerves to the pelvic floor all come through the spinal cord. And so if there are any lesions, if there are any annular tears or bulging discs or you know uh, MS flares, that can affect the sensation anywhere. And so some people get restless leg and some people get numb uh, uh, arousal uh, or, or anhedonia, they lack pleasure. Maybe they get an erection, but they don't feel any pleasure by it. And so anything that's good for your spine is going to be good for this problem. But we don't have a magic patch or a magic injection or something that makes it all go away because it's an underlying problem of the spine pathology. So that's where I would really get the physical therapist involved, the MS specialist involved, uh, maybe the spine people involved, and really all put our heads together to say, how can we get more function back? Because genital sensations is kind of an important thing. And if you had it before and you lose it, understandably, my patients get really pissed off when it's gone um, and they don't understand why their doctors look at them like they have six heads, you know, asking uh, for it to come back. 
And then you mentioned earlier, um, someone wanted to have you explain uh, what does pelvic organ prolapse mean? Yeah. I'm confused on what oh, that meant. Yes, I apologize. I should have had a picture there. So what can happen, and it often happens after childbirth, is the uterus can sometimes fall a little bit and bulge out to the opening of the vagina. Sometimes the bladder can bulge down. Sometimes the rectum can bulge into the vagina. The, 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 if you think of the vagina as a room, okay, it's a room, and sometimes the ceiling can fall down. Sometimes the floor can fall up. Sometimes the walls next to it can kind of collapse in. And so sometimes the different organs that the, the, the that is surrounding the vagina can kind of fall into it. And so if you experience a bulging sensation, sometimes that is the uterus uh, or the bladder sort of prolapsing down. And that can create symptoms of frequency and urgency and uh, worsening um, a, a bowel. Sometimes it's hard to get bowel movements out and you feel that you have to uh, really push them out. and They're not getting, getting, uh, getting out the way you want them to. Does that, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, let's talk about easy solutions. So a lot of times when people start having problems with urinary frequency, they're like, I'm just going to cut the cut back on my fluids. So tell us, is that a good or a bad thing to do or explain what you'd recommend? You know, we have a joke in urology where half of the day we spend telling people that they're not drinking enough water and the other half of the day we spend pe telling people they drink too much water. So we spend our lives a little bit like Goldilocks of like, you should do more, you should do less. And so the whole old adage of you have to have eight glasses of water a day is, is kind of foolish. There's really not a lot of science behind it. Um, but you also don't want to starve yourself of any fluids and get dehydrated. And so it is really important to find good solutions because the answer of not drinking ever it's probably not the best solution uh, uh, for staying healthy. Oh, you know, I've seen this happen, right? Oh, I didn't drink for two days because I was going to my kid's piano recital and I wanted to like be in my best. I didn't, I wanted to sit through the whole thing. And then I passed out during the recital and everyone had to come and I had to go back on an ambulance. And it wasn't, I mean, that has happened, right? So um, it's really important to take care of yourself and to work with your providers to find out that best solution for you. Because maybe it's okay, when I go out, I put an extra a large pad on or when I go out I, I, I catheterize myself right before I go out or you know what is that solution and as technology gets better the solutions keep getting better and better which is really uh, really excellent okay there was another question here I'm so sorry I'm uh, blowing my nose on camera oh you're fantastic I, I eat on camera and I lay down <laughs> I'm too tired during our during our, our support group, so it's all it's all good. Uh, do women uh, that have MS and have a neurogenic bladder tend to have worse symptoms after childbirth? Oh, it's a great question, and I don't know the research behind that. And I'm sure if it hasn't been studied, it should be studied. And so that's something I can get back to that person and do a little. I have a group of medical students who um, my dream is to never have to say to someone we have no data and to find data and to get data and to do more research. So I don't know the answer. Um, my gut would tell me it depends on what happens in MS in pregnancy. Uh, if, people's, if, if the MS is gonna get worse, then bladder symptoms are gonna get worse, right? Because MS is gonna affect the nerves. And so um, also women after childbirth get an increase uh, in urinary problems, whether it's a leakage or you know prolapse issues. And so you add those things together, if that makes sense. And then you talked about women and UTIs. Is this something that men need to worry about? Men get UTIs a little less frequently, although I heard there was just an episode of secession where the main guy got a UTI and it was all over uh, urology Twitter. Um, uh, so men do get urinary tract infections, typically if they have very enlarged prostates or they're not emptying well. So if they're MS is making their bladders a little bit shy and not empty so well, uh, then the bacteria can build up and you can develop a urinary tract infection. I don't have the magic cure of vaginal estrogen to give to my male patients, and so um, uh, it's but they get them much less frequently than uh, females do. And then what would you recommend to help with UTI prevention? I know that when I was on the medication Jelenia for MS, I would get UTIs all the time. There was a point where my husband was afraid to touch me because I would get a UTI. 
Yeah. Um, I, I found D-Manos was very helpful for me, but I, if you could maybe, because UTI seem to be the bane of MSers. Yeah. Um, and that's the first thing when we complain about a flare, the first thing they want to do is pull, a, pull a, a, a UA to get spine up. We have a UTI. Oh, I, yes, Rick. I know many men get UTIs who have MS I, uh, I, I, and, and other things too. I, I'm sure there are lots of stories. Um, UTIs are a huge problem. And as anyone with MS knows, right, these are dangerous, really dangerous. And so um, understanding the, uh, the defenses that you have is really important. D-manos can be very helpful. Cranberry pills, there's a little bit of evidence, like I said. Um, understanding the hormone, the musculoskeletal and the hormonal um, a function of the vulva, the vagina, the urethra, and the bladder is also really important. So if you're on birth control pills, that can sometimes present as a menopausal tissue. Even though you're on this birth control hormone, the tissue sort of sees that and is not getting exactly what it needs because of that birth control pill. And so sometimes fixing that hormone imbalance locally can be a big answer. Not always a, a perfect cure because there are, we're dealing with other issues as well, but but absolutely. So you got to A, make sure you're emptying your bladder correctly. B, make sure that it's hormonally uh, in the right place that it should be. I think that often gets missed. Um, even if you're premenopausal, it sometimes gets missed. And so understanding and then understanding that not all symptoms are a UTI. If you are, you know, having intercourse and, and something is, is really irritating the urethra, uh, that, can, that irritation can feel like a urinary tract infection, it's frequency, urgency, burning, um, but sometimes the culture is totally negative and it becomes actually more of that musculoskeletal, I feel the burn, as opposed to an actual bacterial infection. Does that make sense? I think you explained a lot to me because I get so frustrated because it have these symptoms but then they pull a culture and they're like, yeah, you're fine. Or there's nothing there. And you're just like, well, what, what am I feeling? What the, what the F? So, um, yes. Yeah, so it's often, so you need to find yourself a pelvic floor physical therapist. They will be your best friend in the world. And you also need a doctor to really see, you know, from a whole, and I don't know anything about your history and I'm not going to treat you on, on this webinar and ask you questions, but really see to understand, are you optimized from a, a health of the tissue standpoint, from a defensive standpoint? And also, if you know that the tissue is not going, is going to be irritated with certain activities, can we, um, modify activities to maximize pleasure, but maybe decrease the aftermath of that can happen. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then of course they have my MS moments. So I totally forgot the next question, but I will uh, preface this. The, the over-the-counter UTI test strips, what do you think about those? They're probably fine. So um, what they do is they test leukocytes and, and like white blood cells and nitrites. And so if they're positive, it's a pretty good indication that there's probably an inflammatory thing going on. Anytime you have symptoms of a urinary tract infections, especially if you have an MS diagnosis, please, 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 please get a urine culture. Even if it means having your doctor give you cups so you can pee at home before you start the antibiotics that you already have at home, it's really important because uh, getting that culture will then make sure that you're on the correct antibiotics. There is so much resistance that gets built up, right? And, and that resistance can be even more dangerous than the urinary tract infection itself because if you don't respond to any antibiotics, then it's going to be really hard to treat you if you end up hospitalized or, or something worse happens. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And then you mentioned about potentially treating people. Do you see people outside of your area via telehealth or would people have to travel if they wanted to be treated specifically by you because of your all your information? background between the urological and the, the sex medicine. Yeah, medicine. you know, it's a great question. And I'm in a, a very interesting place in my life right now. I um, um, am actually in the process of, of creating my own private practice and starting my own practice. And so uh, regular medicine wasn't working for my patients or myself of just giving people a lot of time and expertise and really, really uh, diving deeply uh, into different kinds of issues, especially when it comes to sexual health. And so what I typically do is I, I, I typically talk to all patients on the phone for, you know, five minutes before I, I, I to kind of say, okay, what do you need? You know, if you need a really good neurogenic bladder specialist, then I'm going to send you to my best friend down the street or to somebody in your area that we can get. I know every urologist, you know, around the, the, the country to find the 
right people uh, for my patients. Now, if it's a neuro, how sexual health and neurogenic bladder and hormone optimization, then yeah, I'm your gal any day of the week, um, you know, for that kind of stuff. On the male side, again, similar. If it's a sexual function issue um, and a hormone issue, then yeah, that's going to be sort of my expertise. If it's going to be doing your urodynamic evaluation, you don't want me doing that, right? That's, that's where um, I have to phone a friend. And so again, I think it's really important to realize that you are going to have different providers in your life for different phases of your life. So sometimes, you know, you're not going to just have one urologist or one MS specialist that's going to do everything and really coming to that realization kind of takes some of the anger away of like why didn't my general urologist tell me that or why didn't my gynecologist tell me that not you know as doctors we are so human I can't tell you how often I will tell you I don't know uh, but let's work together to figure it out and I'm going to call my friend who does know uh, and we're going to get you the best care possible because there is so much uncertainty which is so frustrating when you're a patient. You just want one person to just say, here's the thing that's going to fix everything. Um, and here, you, of course you want that. But the reality is we just don't have that. And so go to see someone who will hug you and say, I'm sorry, I don't have all the answers, but let's build you a team that where we can maximize the possibility of getting those answers. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. The, the fr dealing with healthcare and how fragmented it is is very frustrating. But that goes into the the other question is that when we start experiencing these symptoms, who would you recommend going to first? Like a neurologist, a primary healthcare practitioner, gynecologist? Like where would you? Because it's such a hard field to navigate. Like which specialty do I go to? And if I go to a urologist, are they going to be trained in? you know, like I'm a female, but you know, obviously are they going to be trained in what I'm needing? You know, it's, it's such a good question. And, and as anyone with any kind of illness like this knows that, that medicine is broken at every level and incredibly frustrating. And, um, and so I would bet, and I don't have data on this, but I bet there is data of, of how long it takes people to get a diagnosis of MS. I, I assume you know it, pro it probably takes years and years and years, and that you've been blown off by lots of doctors for your, you know, a different random symptoms, and then seeing that person who can put it all together. And so I wouldn't be surprised if when you go to urologists that we miss MS diagnoses all the time because someone comes in with a little frequency, a little urgency, and we sort of do our our conservative management, but we don't think bigger about what else could be going on. And so we've got a lot of work to do uh, on the urologic side to get people educated on, okay, this is going on, but is it a part of a bigger systemic sort of neurological issue going on? So always, uh, I would say having a good primary care doctor who, and, and knowing that a primary care doctor is not meant to be a once a year physical. I think getting over that idea that once a year you can be, all of your problems can be solved is finding ways to keep advocating for yourself and going back until you can really understand kind of the overall process that's happening. Of course, neurology, you know, and rheumatology and, and those people who think more broadly can sometimes be very helpful. And then a urologist who specializes in either female urology or neuro, neurogenic bladder uh, can also be very helpful. Okay, and then what do you, th this is just a weird side, but what do you think about bidets? Because they were like totally out of, and then the, ne the last, I don't know, five years or something, they're coming a rage, especially with the pandemic, with the toilet paper issue. What do you think about bidets? Do you think it's actually more hygienic? Do you think it helps with some of these problems that we have? Well, I love that question for one reason is we went to visit my mother-in-law um, just this past weekend for Thanksgiving and my four-year-old uh, sat on her heated toilet seat bidet and dried her little tiny butt uh, with this little button. And then when she got home, she's like, mommy, the toilet seat is cold. And she was complaining that the toilet seat was too cold. So that's kind of funny. Um, I have no opinion of bidets other than if you like it and you feel that it is good uh, for you. I could see how um, uh, if somebody uh, were limited in their ability to reach and wipe and, and, and kind of keep the area clean, then that might be helpful. Um, but I don't, um, I don't have um, specific data to point to. If you like it, keep doing it, I would say. Okay, I don't know if you saw like a, if it's kind of like a, the dentistry where manual toothbrush versus the electric toothbrush, huge difference in, in your checkups later on. So just like 
just anything to to help out seriously <laughs> You know, every, you know, it's a good idea to do a, a study. on. You know, I think the idea that it has to be so clean is also not a, a good thing. You know, vaginas are not clean places, right? They are not sterile environments. Um, they are full of bacteria. Uh, uh, the rectum and poop is full of bacteria. That doesn't mean it's unhealthy to have it around. In fact, you need bacteria and you need a healthy microbiome. Um, it's just, and, and actually without estrogen, that's when the microbiome really changes and alters and increases your risk of your inner tract infection. So not all bacteria is, you know, a, a sign of, you know, a, a dirtiness or, or filth. We are not sterile, sterile humans. We might get too sterile sometimes. Now, here's a, another weird side thing. Weird things pop in my head. I apologize, Doctor. So, the, is it a myth or not that your urine is sterile? It's a myth, actually. It's a total okay. myth. Yeah. So, uh, especially you know, now that everyone knows what PCR is, um, if you take PCR data, you know, and kind of spin urine down, you see all sorts of things in there. And so that's why it's really important that if you have no symptoms, I would say it's complicated with you have MS because often symptoms can come up in funny ways. But if you have someone with no symptoms and they pee in a cup and it grows bacteria, you don't necessarily have to treat them with antibiotics, nor should you treat them with antibiotics most of the time. Now, of course, there are special situations like if you're pregnant and things like that. Um, but we're kind of moving away from treating what we call asymptomatic bacteriuria or um, urine bacteria in the urine without symptoms. And so that's sort of an important point. And then there is a question about tibial nerve simula uh, stimulation. Is yeah. uh, transucantaneous versus percutaneous, are they just as effective? How do they compare on their efficacy? Um, Very specific question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know what? Well, because PTMS is percutaneous, so transcutaneous. I guess I don't know what the difference. I don't know, like a tens unit. I, I, you know, the studies are on the little uh, acupuncture needle. Although there are a lot of studies going on right now of different, you know, home versions. Uh, there's a study going on right now, something called eCoin, which is a little implantable a coin that they just put in your uh, ankle. So your urologist is gonna start doing ankle surgery, which is kind of funny. Um, and that's sort of an implantable PTNS-like device. And so we need more data. I mean, I don't, I don't think I, I have a perfect answer for you uh, other than to say it doesn't work for everybody, but when it works, um, it, 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 it's unlikely to cause major harm. And then do urologic problems for men and women, can they use all the different medications available? Obviously not the estrogen for men, but like all the over-the-counter thing, not over-the-counter, it's been a long day. No, <laughs> like Tetral, right. Ditropan, all that stuff. That works for men too. It's not just, yep. Yep. all these they, drugs are not just for women because they correct. all work the same way on the bladder, even though correct. we're- and for men, there's a couple, you know, even for men, you know, so there are some medications that for a prostate relaxation that often get used, uh, you know, alpha blockers like Flomax or um, uh, even we use Cialis. Uh, we use daily Cialis as a wonderful medication to help with the flow of urine for uh, aging men. It can help with erections as well, which is never a bad side effect. So, um, uh, yeah, so uh, and those are um, also those medications can also be used by women for different uh, reasons, um, but tend to not be used as often. Okay, Get, going, getting up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom, how much is too much and what we can do to help cut back on waking up in the middle of the night going, I have to get up again? <laughs> it's such an important point because sleep is absolutely essential for human functioning, right? You need sleep to have a good quality of life, to feel rested, to have good hormones, to um, feel strong, to feel uh, for brain health. Um, sleep is so important. And when your bladder does not let you sleep, it's a huge problem. And so um, again, there's no correct number of this is normal or this is abnormal. It's all you know, how can we improve your quality of life? And so typically people can sleep through the night or get up once at night and that's like reasonable. But when you're getting up, you know, more than two times at night, it is time to talk to your doctor and say, this is just not working for me. And it, they have to do some testing to figure out is it only a nighttime problem? 
Is it an all day and all night problem? What are solutions that you have tried? You know, what is going on with the person in front of me? Because they are not like your neighbor or somebody else on your support group. You all have slightly different bladders and spine issues and brain issues. And so, uh, and they may change, which is the other very frustrating thing, right? It's not a static issue. So you a little bit have to deal with the fact of being a moving target and that what's happening in one season of your life is not necessarily going to be what's happening in the next season and finding that team who can work with you to say, hey, I think we're in a new season here. So what I'm getting from you is that instead of just suffering from these things, we need to re real be big self-advocates and go, look, I'm having these issues with urinary, you know, frequency, urgency. I'm getting up to the bathroom multiple times. I feel like I have a UTI, but I don't have it. Like, just need to be really on it and getting the answers and seeking help and not just being like, well, I guess I just deal with it. And, you know, I guess I can't go to the movies or something because I'm terrified or. Two, I can't, I can't hug you enough for saying that, yes, you know, too often we say, okay, well, I guess the intimate part of my life is over, or I guess this fun part of going out of my life is over. And you adjust, you let your bladder win, or you let your, your, your issue, your, your medical issues win, as opposed to saying, maybe I just haven't tried the right thing or, or, and here's the other thing is show yourself some grace and some love, because when you have these types of issues, you're going to do this, Right. Your goal, everyone is going to do that. And so find when you get the motivation, when you get the 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 advocacy behind your back and, and get yourself, that's why the support groups are so amazing because you all have each other's backs of saying, hey, we I tried this. Maybe you should talk to your doctor about this or bring in this study to your provider or show, hey, I know of this physical therapist who's amazing. Why don't you go? And, and that's good. So when you're on an upswing, put some effort into it. And then when you're on a downswing, show yourself some grace and to know that you can't, you can't go 100 miles an hour every minute of the day. Um, and so you're, you're going to have to find those seasons where you want to put the effort in and where, where you just don't have it in you. And then find the doctors who can help advocate with you, right? And who can help push you a little bit to try the things maybe you haven't tried or to, you know, do different testing and, and things like that. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's just like, I don't know. It's just, it, it comes to a point where, like, where do you give up? Where do you fight? Where do you, you know, because sometimes it's easier to like, well, I'll just stay home because I don't want to deal with the embarrassment of having an incident in public or I don't feel comfortable wearing diapers or diapers feels really weird, which random question, how, what percentage of adults do you think actually wear adult diapers? Do you have any idea? I don't know. I don't know that number for you, but if you look at the size of the um, uh, section in the grocery store, that should give you some indication where it is not a small number, right? And and it's not just your, you know, 90-year-old woman. Uh, they have male ones. They have female ones. I mean, this is a very common um, issue. And again, nobody talks about it. And so the more we don't talk about it, the the fewer solutions we will have. And so the more you talk about it, you'll find out that your friend has this awesome brand of underwear that she found, or that your other friend has this clamp for the penis that he found that's amazing. Or, you know, and that again, the technology is changing and advocates like all of you can help to change it, right? That's the other thing is, is if there's something we don't like, we have to talk about it so that we can demand better, uh, better things. And so, um, it matters. It really matters. Your quality of life really, really matters. What is the point of keeping you alive for as long as possible if if the quality is not uh, maximized any way that we can have it? And so um, don't, you know, I find the quality of life issues in my mind are the most important um, because that's what keeps that spark. That's what keeps the joy. That's what, ke what keeps the intimacy and the fun and that keeps you going. And it can look totally different for different people. My joy comes from having these conversations and, and, and teaching people about this stuff. That's where I get my dopamine rush. Other people get it from video games. Other people get it from going on vacation and sitting on a beach. Uh, I wish I was one of those people. Um, you know, so you have to, your joy matters and, and, and you have to find out what that is. Just a side note for anyone that wants to try diapers and have them. I've tried them before, and they're actually way more comfortable than you think they are. 
like you think they'd be the most uncomfortable thing in the world. They're actually pretty comfortable. I just want to throw that out there. Everyone's like, that's when I'm like, Ugh. you know, that's, that's, that's kind of scary. Okay, we keep touching about sex thing. We keep touching the sex thing. Let's dive into the sex stuff. So I will let you start off unless you want me to ask you a, a question. But go, well, just... I, 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 you know, listen, I am a sex doctor. I focus my, I look at everything in the, in the lens of how it is affecting people's sexual function and sexual health. And I'm a big believer that sex looks different for everybody. And what you want out of your sex life is totally different than what uh, someone else. And I'll give you a story. I, one of my favorite patients is an MS patient. She is 65 years old and she came to see me uh, because she lost her orgasm and she has never been partnered. She has no partner. Um, she, um, lives alone. She has a great life. She's got lots of great friends. Um, she has no interest in getting a partner. And she came to see me. She went out of her doctor. Uh, she talked about it with her urologist and her urologist said, I have no idea what's going on. Go talk to Ruben. She'll try to figure it out. And she came to see me and we optimized her hormone situation and we talked devices and we got her sort of understanding what was going on. We had her MS evaluated and we all talked about this and we got her to the point where she got her orgasm back and she was thrilled. I was like her favorite doctor and she was so happy and satisfied with the quality of her life from that moment. And that made her life better. And she, you know, and, and she should have that. And so sex can, I love that story because sex looks different for everybody. And so what's important to you may not be what's important for your neighbor. Um, and so I, I treat all genders. And so whether it's erectile problems or orgasm problems for females or libido issues all around, we see all sorts of issues, but it is, it, it, it's understanding the, the person in front of me because every person who's in front of me has a different medical history, has a slightly different surgical history, has different medications that they're on and has a different sort of psychosocial life of how were they raised and what is their partner situation and what do they want. And, and so what an incredible puzzle to be able to work with couples or individuals and say, what's going on and how on earth am I going to do that in 10 minutes? There's no way I can't even do it in an hour without wanting to bang my head against the wall saying I need another day, you know, I need more time because people are complex, but that's what makes it fun. That's not what makes it hard. That's what makes it fun. And when you can restore someone's libido or restore someone's orgasm or restore someone's erection to the point where now maybe he has to use a needle to get an erection, but it works reliably like a porn star every time, you save the world, right? You give people that confidence to say, hey, um, this is, I'm having fun again, right? Again, what gives you that joy? What gives you the fun? If it's not you know, intimacy or, or sexual sex time, then find out what it is and you don't need to see me, right? And, but, but for so many people, that connection, that intimacy, that touch doesn't have to be penetration. It doesn't have to be orgasm, but whatever that looks like is, is important to many people. Um, and it's sort of that lifeline for many people. And again, we, we never talk about it. And when we don't talk about it, you think you're the only one who has these issues and you're not the only one who has these issues. In fact, you know, most people have, everyone has sexual problems. It's just nobody talking, not everybody talks about it. And so, um, Sex should not be painful, right? Sex should always be fun and enjoyable and pleasurable. And figuring out how to make it even better is, is the joy of what I do. And sometimes it's working with mental health professionals. Sometimes it's working with physical therapists or MS specialists or whoever I have to work with to finding the right device. Um, the sex tech industry is amazing now, right? Uh, I just saw, I just tweeted out today that uh, there uh, is a new a, a device out there for people with disabilities who maybe are in a wheelchair. And so it's a, a something that vibrates that's a little bit easier to hold or, you know, and so again, thinking about people with disabilities deserve good sex lives. People who are overweight deserve good sex lives. People with MS deserve good sex lives. And so you don't have to be a supermodel Right. And you don't have to be Brad Pitt to, to deserve a good sex life. Um, and so that's really what I do is making sex relatable and medical and, and really getting people to understand that that it's a it's, it's biology. And how can we get biology working better? 
There was an article, MS Society has a magazine called, uh, called Momentum. And in the, I'm just writing, doing this so people want to check out the archives. There was their summer of 2016 issue actually addressed intimacy issues. And it was so um, refreshing to hear they did a female and a male. The male had to use Viagra to have sex, uh, to have sex. And the female said, I have to use a plug in vibrator for 20 minutes. And I just thought that was so refreshing to hear like, yes, this, cause vibrators come in all shapes and sizes. I have to use the, like the Hitachi plug it in super hardcore because nothing else is going to help. And I just thought that was just so refreshing. It's well, like, yeah, it's, that's it's, that. There's so just so much rage. Right. Is, 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 you know, uh, reflex orgasms are reflex right? When you can stimulate that reflex, you can have an orgasm. And if your nerves are not working so well and your reflexes are slowed down, then what's going to happen to your orgasm? So sometimes you have to do more sensation. And so it may not be a hand that works anymore. It may not be be a, a phallus that works anymore. It may be something that vibrates and normalizing uh, devices to enhance sexual fun should be the rule. I, I always joke that if I can get and male devices are are fabulous now. They've got they've come such a long way over the years. And so I always say if I can get men to realize that that penises like vibration as much as clitorises do, that I can really improve women's sexual health because if men finally say that it's something they want, then women will benefit from them uh, sort of in the bedroom. And so often female partners are not uh, they're afraid to bring it up because they don't want to uh, upset or disappoint their partner. And that's where the communication issue is so important is, again, we can often talk about uh, constipation with our partners. We can often talk about uh, uh, children's uh, bodily functions and all of these things, but we don't often talk about masturbation or orgasm or sex, you know, even with the person that you are actively trying to have it with. And so I, I think that's really important. And yes, normalizing these things and normalizing Viagra, it's just a muscle relaxer, right? All it does is relax muscle so that your penis, which is a muscle, can relax and blood can flow through it. That's why it works for bladder issues as well, right? So you take Viagra, relaxes your muscles, your blood can flow through your penis, it can expand and get harder. That's all it is. It's not magic, it's science. And so when people understand, oh, honey, uh, my erections aren't working because I have a diabetes and high blood pressure and MS, uh, and you know I've got all these other uh, issues. Uh, of course, my muscles and my penis are not working well. Let me go take my muscle relaxer, as opposed to, honey, uh, you're not dressing up anymore and you're not putting on makeup and give me a break. It's all biology. When you can really get people to understand the biology, it hurts so much less. Let's talk about loss of libido. I know that happens a lot with perimenopause, menopause, but I found out I was on Cymbalta to treat with the um the pain the pair the pain in my foot and leg and I had to eventually to get off of that because it's I'm a female but essentially chemically castrated me and I know what medications can you think of that affect the libido that would be like we're we're taking the medication to help treat MS but then the side effect of it is like oh that just killed my libido Yes. So any medication, you know, that acts on your brain can affect your libido and sexual function. So any medication that can affect your hormones can affect your libido and sexual function. So the big categories, um, you know, for libido, uh, birth control pills can certainly affect libido for some people, not all people. Uh, and so any acne medications, anything that affects your testosterone levels can certainly affect libido. And any medication that works on your serotonin dopamine response, like uh, an SSRI or a medication for depression can sometimes help and sometimes hurt. And so one person's, um, I give this example all the time. So uh, a man who has premature ejaculation, uh, we often give him antidepressants to slow down his orgasm. But some people you give them antidepressants and you slow down their orgasm and kill their libido and they're very upset with you. And so one man's uh, cure is another man's nightmare. And so it's a delicate balance. And so it's really important to um, understand that it is not 
magic, it's network, it's biology, and then tinkering with the biology to make it work better for you. So finding ways to boost dopamine in your brain can be very helpful. For some men, that's testosterone. For some women, it's testosterone. For some women and men, it can be things like Wellbutrin and Buspar and um, some of the newer uh, antidepressants that can boost dopamine a little bit better. There are FDA approved medications for libido. It's, they're FDA approved in women, but they work in everybody and they work by boosting dopamine in your brain. And so there are medications that can help with libido, but your doctor's never asked you about your libido. You think your doctor is going to know how to treat your libido uh, or feel comfortable? You know, that's the, that's the struggle we have is we can barely get your doctors to talk about it, let alone understand all of the treatments uh, that surround it. So we, as you understand why I have so much work to do. Okay, we had a question in the chat about someone's having uh, trouble fully emptying their bladder. Any suggestions? Having trouble emptying their bladder. Yes. Yeah. Oh, I like it. So, so um, definitely need testing to make sure to kind of see is the problem that your bladder is not squeezing enough, or is the plot problem at the pelvic floor level where it's not relaxing enough to let the urine out. So set your bladder is a balloon. So if it's not squeezing enough, it's not going to empty uh, the, think of it as a water balloon. If you squeeze the water balloon, the, the, um, the water will come out. But if you tie a knot at the bottom of the water balloon and you squeeze as hard as you can, it's still not going to come out. So if you've got a tightening at the urethra level, that can be the problem. So you have to do some testing to figure that out. If it's a problem that your muscles are not relaxing, then the physical therapy can be a great option. If it's a problem that your bladder is not squeezing, then things like catheterizing yourself, you know, three or four times a day can be life changing and actually incredibly liberating um, because uh, it can really give some a great quality of life back. Okay, going back to the sexual health issues, vaginal dryness. Talk about recommendations, water versus silicone, like just because I know that a lot of people don't use stuff and then they're in a lot of pain. Yes. So sex should never hurt. I can't say that loudly enough. Sex should never hurt. And so um, lubricants are great. So if you give a bunch of people who have no sexual problems, you add lube to their uh, daily uh, activities and their sex lives get way better. So you take people with no problems, add lubricant, everything gets way better. But if you take someone who have hormone deficiencies or pelvic floor problems or, you know, real by uh, pathologies and you just add lubricant, things might get a little better, but you're not fixing the problem. It's just a Band-Aid going on the problem. So I love Band-Aids when you need them, but it's really important to understand and see a doctor who's actually looking into what is going on to actually help you. And I think that is the key there is lidocaine and lubricants are not often the answer um it should not be first like the only therapy that you are given by a doctor so if sex is painful we need to figure out why the most common reasons are hormone problems either menopause or birth control pills um, and those can affect the hormones locally at the vulva which can cause pain with insertion and penetration and muscle problems, right? So if you have muscles, if your pelvic muscles are tight and really tense, um, then that is going to cause pain uh, with penetration as well. Those are the most common reasons why people have pain with sex. So if it's a hormone problem, you have to fix the hormone piece, sometimes by adding, uh, th changing around birth control uh, or adding a vaginal estrogen if you're in menopause. Um, and if it is a uh, muscle problem, then again, those physical therapists can be life saving. And sometimes it's both. Um, I often say, how often do you put your hand on a hot stove? You never do it, right? Your body is going to move away from that hot stove. And so what happens is uh, if something is coming to penetrate you, your muscles underneath are tightening to say, oh, we don't want that. And they get tighter and tighter and tighter. And uh, men get this too, by the way. Um, they get pelvic floor problems as well. And their symptoms are also frequency and urgency, sometimes constipation, pain with sitting. Uh, I think the Peloton bike is going to keep me in business for many years to come. So all those Black Friday sales, I just look at and I say, oh my gosh, more patients coming my way. Because when you really sit on your genitals and put pressure on them, you can create a lot of musculoskeletal pathologies. 
So would a pelvic floor physical therapist potentially also help males? Oh, absolutely. They are geniuses. Okay. You often have to go to ones that know how to treat males, which are becoming more and more frequent. Um, but yes, anything, it's totally equivalent. And it's all the same, again, the same biology. We all have pelvic floors uh, and, um, and they can all be damaged with uh, any of these issues. What about changes with sensation, whether reduced or heightened or a painful sensation? Yeah, so again, um, getting an evaluation, often think of it like sciatica. Instead of saying my genital pain or my genital numbness, think of it as I have back pain, right? I have sciatica in my leg. It's not a leg problem, it's a back problem. Think again, I have hyposensation or hyperarousal or hypersensation. It's probably not a a genital problem, it's probably a neurological problem. And in the case of someone with MS, it, it's kind of trying to understand where is the lesion, right? And that's that that becomes a, a game for someone a little bit smarter than myself, but oftentimes working with someone from a neurological standpoint and a musculoskeletal standpoint, you can find some benefits and improvements. So which doctor would you recommend uh, to someone to go to to help them with their hormone issues? Yeah, so um, anytime there's a hormone issue going on, if you are menopausal, you're going to want to see someone who is very knowledgeable about hormones. And that is typically someone who is um, a certified menopause practitioner. So there is a, um, a website called NAMS, the North American Menopause Society, N-A-M-S. Um, they have a find a provider uh, a section on their on their website. And so that doesn't mean everyone's as equally competent, but uh, at least it's a good, um, they took a test and they know a little bit about hormones. That doesn't mean they know a lot, but they know, I, I, I passed the test. So that means a lot of people can pass the test. Um, uh, so that would be a great place to go, as well as um, my favorite uh, um, society, which I'm the education chair of, which is called ISWSH, I-S-S-W-S-H. Uh, International Society for the Study of Women's Sexual Health, ISSWSH. Uh, they also have a find a provider section on their website, which uh, if anyone who is on that website just has a passion for helping uh, women's sexual issues, so that often comes with some knowledge of hormones. So what would you say to sum up, would you recommend, what's the best thing for us to do for our your, uh, urological and, and sexual health? Yeah. But what's the best thing for us to do? What, what to do? What maybe to avoid? Like, what can we do without just drugs besides asking for help on our own to be like, yeah, this is, this is, this is good for me. I think knowledge, 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 and education is everything is the more you can educate yourself to understanding the, the what's happening and to realizing that you deserve a quality of life and that you, and you have to do the, you know, the, sometimes you have to advocate for yourself as you have all learned the hard way uh, that you really do have to advocate for yourself. And in this case, it's worth it. Uh, it is worth it to advocate for yourself. And if we can make improvements uh, and along the way hopefully our improvements will improve um, if we can just improve different things about your quality of life that would be worth it and so uh, just advocating for yourself and, and educating yourselves to know that just because one provider may not be fully educated in all aspects that doesn't mean it doesn't exist okay. Uh, we're wrapping up here. Let me just see a couple of these questions. Another question person had was about stress incontinence and treatment options. Like when should you worry about, like, I guess it's when it becomes problematic or something, but. If you are bothered by it, it is a problem. I can't stress that enough. I have so many wrinkles in my forehead here that you can see, right? I could go to a dermatologist tomorrow and get all sorts of botulinum toxin in these wrinkles if I'm bothered by it. I'm not bothered by the wrinkles in my forehead, but there's nothing wrong with me if I go to a doctor and say, hey, can you put something in there to fix those wrinkles? If you pee on yourself and it bothers you, which it is normal for it to bother you, go see someone. You do not have to live like this. And there are so many different options and something that's going to be right for you. And I think we too often tell people, uh, suck it up, right? Uh, suck it up. We did this. You're going to have to do it. We suffered. And, and we pass it on from generation to generation, this idea that you have to live a certain way. And I think um, uh, you deserve pleasure. You deserve quality of life and you deserve to take care of yourself 
because if you're not putting your oxygen mask on first, how are you gonna take care of everybody else, right? You're gonna run out of steam at some point. So true. Do you have any recommendations on either uh, books or websites or good sources of information on these topics? Or um, all your different places that we can find you at, like on Twitter and Instagram? And always happy to have people follow me on social media and watch my journey of starting my own practice and getting things up and running, which is very exciting. Um, uh, there's a wonderful Instagram is a wonderful place of pelvic floor physical therapists and sex educators and smart people. Um, uh, uh, the Sexual Medicine Society of North America has some nice content on their website. ISWISH will be having some more nice content on their website. Um, there are different resources out there and, and certainly we could put together a list of some resources, but I'm always posting. I'm always uh, retweeting and Instagramming and posting some really great resources. There's a friend of mine who's a urologist who has a great podcast that's called uh, You Are Not Broken. It's sort of all about libido and, and it's uh, uh, typically geared for women. Uh, you Are Not Broken. I've done a lot of uh, podcasts and, and webinars and things like that. If you go on my social media, you can see a link to all of those different resources uh, in my bio for all of those. So happy to help any way that I can. And um, we just, we have a lot of work to do, but this is really important. It would be so amazing to normalize this conversation. I think it would be so helpful <laughs> for so many people. I don't I know why we so. have such a stigma to it, so. We're, we're talking it, we're, we're talking about it as, as often as we can and to anyone who will listen. And so um, I don't feel weird talking about it. Maybe, uh, you know, it's, it's, I'm over it. So hopefully the more we talk about it, the, the better uh, people will, um, the better care people will get. Is there anything else you'd like to say before we hand it over to uh, Jen? Just thank you so much for having me. It was an absolute honor and um, really, really, you ask wonderful questions and you are such a lovely moderator. So thank you very much. Oh, thanks. Let's do this again. <laughs> Anytime. <laughs> okay, Dan and Jen are gonna come on. Thank you so much for doing this. This was super fun for me and I got to ask some of my own personal questions yes. and a lot of other people's questions too. So. You are wonderful and brave and, and really uh, Dan and Jen, uh, it's so wonderful to meet you as well. And thank you for hosting such a lovely evening. Well, thank you so very much, Dr. Rubin. This was a fascinating conversation and we all really gained. So we want to, and Ann can, we want to thank you for your time and your educating us all. We want to thank Sam Greenberg with MS for MS. Thank you for doing work for our community. Of course, we want to thank Alexa Jett for moderating, to, or well, for help getting this started. And then Kim for moderating, that was wonderful. And Rick Davis with Ann Can. And following up on that, um, I know there had been posted in the chat um, throughout the evening and everything, but just be sure to join us on our virtual MS support group, which meets 8.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, the second and fourth Tuesday of every month. Um, go to ancan.org and check out the support groups and find us there. And we hope to see you soon, but thanks to everyone for being a part of this tonight. So take care.